Seal Potter. Uh, Dr. Potter is a postdoctoral researcher with WSU with expertise in soil microbial ecology and nutrient cycling. And again, you can read more about all of the speakers um, at the bottom of the sessions page. And it looks like we have um, Teal's slides up. So please uh, take it away, Teal. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to give some basic info about soil microbes, um, hopefully fun facts for everyone there, and build into connecting this idea of feed your microbes just back to the simple idea of, of what we know of carbon and nutrient, nitrogen nutrient cycles. And then I'm going to build some of that in to try and provide some guidance on if you're interested in buying biological products, just from my point of view as a scientist. I'm having a hard time advancing my slides without muting myself. That's a new thing. I'm going to get rid of this laser pointer. That seems to help. Okay, so first, what is a soil microbial community, right? We're talking about organisms interacting in their environment. So microbes, you need a microscope to see them. You can't see them with the naked eye. Often we're talking about bacteria and fungi, but there are many microscopic organisms like archaea, algae, nematodes, and protists um, in this really complex environment, right? I have highlighted this little biofilm in this drawing where most of the bacteria are congregated. Um, so very spatially heterogeneous. How big are microbes? So smallish bacteria, you could fit 1,000 in one millimeter. Or another you know, fun fact is you could fit roughly 50 um, one micrometer smaller bacteria along the width of an average human hair. This is an image of that representing that. How dense are they in soil? Well, a single gram of soil may contain billions of microbial cells. And you've probably heard these figures um, before, but you know, I really dug into the literature to say, what are we looking at? And, and it is billions. Um, so this is a photo I took of soil piled on a nickel, and that's about a gram of soil. How diverse are they? We're talking about millions of genetically distinct types on a single gram of soil. Totally amazing. So how quickly do these soil microbial communities change? Um, this ranges a lot and we don't have great tools, um, but it can be one to 100% cell turnover per day. A recent study that's using a, a new method, QSIP, um, shows this uh, data from a bunch of different studies in this figure. And it's showing this combination of births and deaths turnover uh, for three, almost 300 species or taxa in the soil. And their estimate was, you know, between 10 and 20% turnover per day early on in actual soil matrix. And how much does nitrogen change microbial communities? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of studies on this, right? But I'm gonna go ahead and summarize this as it's almost always less than 10% change, right? And so here's just one example where you're looking at um, the relative abundance of different uh, bacterial groups on the x-axis and the abund relative abundance on the y. And the this black bar is no fertilizer. And then you have these different fertilizer, fertilizer regimes that have been carried out for many years. And much of the research, research highlights that there are significant differences. But as I'm seeing this data come in over and over and with my own studies, I'm really drawn to the fact of how small it is. And then we have to think about, can that change possibly impact you know, your cover crop six months from now or long-term carbon storage? So um, the changes we're seeing are actually pretty small. We're not killing off our microbes. They're pretty resilient. And that, you know, we can also see that as a good thing. They're sticking around. 
I also am showing you this image of a grain of salt in the lower right hand corner. Um, and that is to show you this is how big a grain of salt you should be taking some of these generalizations. Or I'm giving you orders of magnitude um, because there is so much variability and we're still really needing better tools to answer some pretty simple questions. Okay. Um, another important aspect of this work is just knowing, do microbial groups have unique functions, you know, different taxa? And something that is really, there's a few things that really complicate this compared to looking at mammals or any other organisms. Um, this idea of horizontal gene transferring is fascinating. So most, you know, for humans and most animals and organisms, you pass on genetic material from mother to baby. That's how it works. But in bacteria, you can, in microbes, they can actually leak some DNA or you can actually have dead um, bacteria on the ground or in the ground that have little bits of fragments of DNA that can just be absorbed by neighboring cells. And some of that DNA and gene can get incorporated into their genome and be functional. So this would be like me giving my gene for making lactase to my husband so that he can um, you know, eat more dairy. And that's just totally amazing, but it complicates these functions across groups. Also, no microbes are actually good or bad all the time. And this is, I think, underappreciated. You know, mycorrhizal fungi is an example of a mutualist that can deliver nutrients to plants. But if that mycorrhizae is not getting carbon from the plant or is otherwise stressed out, um, in some cases we see them becoming parasites to the plant and trying to take and steal those nutrients. So this is really context dependent. Um, so to summarize, this question, do microbial groups have unique functions? Um, it's really fuzzy. Um, yes, generally there are similar functions within um, taxa or families, but not like you'd see with other groups. You could see that very different, different distantly related groups share similar functions, maybe an antibiotic resistance gene or a drought resistant gene. And then you have E. coli, where different populations have different genes and can do different things, which is amazing. So I think this is important for some background for thinking about what we can expect from microbes and some of the challenges of studying them. Finally, bring it back, you know, why do we care about soil microbes, right? They decompose stuff, organic matter, litter, residue to make new soil. That's a primary thing. They make nutrients accessible to plants and they hold soil together among other things, but these, these are the big ones of the bulk soil communities. So let's move on and connect feed your microbes to carbon and nitrogen nutrient cycling. So feed your microbes is this hot new phrase that I'm hearing a lot, um, a lot, a lot of the time without context. And I think just like discussing soil health, we need to have that conversation of what do you mean? <laughs> so um, in its simplest form, I think what is meant is add organic carbon, um, but what happens to that organic carbon? So here on the left side, I have you know, various ways you can add organic carbon and many more manure, biosolids, cover crops. Um, they can add to the soil and the microbial communities. And what happens to this carbon? Well, it can be incorporated into the bodies of those microbes so they can grow. You know, our bodies, their bodies are mostly carbon. Um, and they can reproduce you know, when they have the resources they need and more carbon. Um, but they're also gonna be respiring carbon. So the way we get energy to do things and they get energy to do things is by breaking bonds in molecules and respiring. And so that is just, you know, a necessary part of this process. So if that's all that is meant by feed your microbes, then we're 
mission accomplished, right? Um, but ultimately, I don't think we are feeding the microbes because we love the microbes, right? It's probably because we want to do something beneficial for our crops or maybe to store carbon in the soil longer. So let's follow what's happening with the nitrogen in this scenario. So we're adding these inputs also to add nitrogen, organic nitrogen. And as the microbes decompose these polymers, um, you know, as Kirsten referred to them, the larger complex molecules um, into inorganic forms, it's releasing nitrogen, again, for the microbes to use um, in their structures. Um, and also, you know, they're using energy to make enzymes out, which they secrete out of their bodies. And that is how they're mobilizing nutrients in the soil for their own use, but because they're in the soil matrix, plants can use them too. So there we go. We have completed this cycle for plants. We um, fed our microbes and we've um, mobilized various types of nutrients, including nitrogen for plants. Uh, I'll also mention, but others have already mentioned that a way we can keep more of that carbon in the soil um, that's being appreciated in science and seems to be going strong is that the dead microbial necromass seems to be adhering to soil minerals and sticking around longer than other forms of um, organic matter and, and soil and uh, more so than lignin. So just for a minute, Let's consider that the length of this arrow is the total carbon inputs for this um, one amendment. And so I have the length of the purple arrow is those carbon amendments in the soil. And so as time passes, you're going to see that microbes are processing a little of that carbon and releasing a little CO2. And, it, and more and more is going to be released as CO2 over time. Right, that is inevitable. So this question is really important, I think. I'm just drawing to your attention that it's really hard to build, keep this, so, uh, this exact carbon in the soil and not release some if we want microbes to be doing work for us, if we want them to be active in doing some of their services. So this hope for both this feed your microbes idea and incorporating soil microbial measurements into soil health is to leverage and optimize the services that they already provide, right? But this more specific question is, can we manage soils to maximize beneficial microbial activities and keep more carbon in the soil for longer? And I'm surprised how rarely I see this discussed um, as a trade-off. You know, I think talking about the emissions and the um, the respiration and the storage and the same conversation is really important. Um, you know, the science is still learning a lot about the basics of microbes. So we're not really ready or able to manage microbes and, and bring this into precision management um, for farming scenarios, unfortunately, is, is my view. That is not true in all cases for microbes that have more specific relationships with plants. The science is, is much beyond this, but this is for general soil communities. And I want to stop and pause and say we can definitely still appreciate our microbes for what they're doing and how important they are, and also accept that feeding them is not precise management yet. So on to the last part. So to provide a little bit of guidance on buying biologicals. Got a little time here, good. So I think the big question here is, will a biological product work in my soil? And I personally have not worked with biologicals. There's tons of products out there. So I'm giving you my scientist point of view of what I would do if I were considering it. And I have a couple of questions for you that you can ask yourself and um, reps from companies that might be interested in selling you products. And the first is just, is there a product that tar targets my soil health need, right? 
a lot of products are supposed to enhance the nitrogen availability in your soil. But if you're already managing that well, you know, by inputs, you know, inorganic fertilizer or other, um, then maybe you don't need a product that would be expensive and risky. You know, that's up to you. Think about it. If, is there a real need there? And then what types of soils, or sorry, what soil types has the product worked on successfully? How consistently? These products don't show you all their data <laughs> and you might have to ask to see more. Um, I've never seen, you know, a bar graph with error bars. They don't, so you should ask, you know, what soil types was this successful on? And, you know, what percentage of the time? Where, you know, where's, what does the full picture look like? And then remembering that microorganisms behave differently in different contexts, right? So it might not work the same way in your field as one nearby. And finally, does it seem feasible that um, this product or organism can compete with the microbes already present in your field? This is, you know, obviously a little also hard to answer but I'm gonna give you a nice little example, I think, to think about. Um, and the background I've already talked about, remember that microbes are really dense in the soil already. Um, so if we're adding them, I think that's gonna be a challenge for that microbe to coexist perhaps. Um, and it's also hard to change the composition of microbial communities we've seen from these long-term experiments. So I guess I'm just gonna to read this. Close your eyes if you don't like looking at the text, but someone else already did. Haley Gash did a great um, back of the envelope calculation. So I didn't redo it myself. So she calculates that one square meter of soil, 15 centimeters deep contains 105 trillion colony forming units. That's cells. Um, Meanwhile, 10 gallons for a bacterial product containing 250 million cells per gallon adds up to 2.5 billion cells. So adding 2.5 billion cells to a fiercely competitive community of 105 trillion cells would initially increase the cell count by 0.0024%, right? These numbers are not even accounting for fungi, and we don't have the tools to track it. So at field scale, you know, I really encourage people to get out their Valentine cards, get look, start do this calculation on the back of the envelope, like you would for any other inputs on your farm, and figure out if you're going to need a bucket or you know three truckloads to make some cell count that seems reasonable to to do something in your fields. Um, and so if you are interested, I'd say smart, start small. Um, and if you're doing something more precise, like you're growing crops in a greenhouse, you might have more control and that could, those, there's products out there that have been well vetted for those more controlled situations. Um, if you're otherwise trying uh, on a larger field, I would say do your own experiment, you know, buy a little bit and add it to a representative part of your field, maybe a couple places, maybe a couple years, and then make sure you come back and see if you're getting the results you want. Um, yeah, that's, that's my advice. So with that, um, I think I've addressed some microbial basics, discussed feed your microbes, and provided some guidance and um, there is more on nitrogen cycling and microbes in the next talk, so please stick around. Fabulous, Teal. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you've covered a, a lot of a lot of points that, um, yeah, I think we're we're really trying to get across to um, producers um, and um, people who are um, trying to learn more about soil microorganisms and um, uh, you know. Uh, not always seeing information from from uh, research based sources. Um, so some questions for you. Um, one is about biological amendments. So will will the introduced microorganisms reproduce in real world situations? Ooh, 
I'm going to warn you that I have not worked with biologicals, right? So, um, and done experiments on them. So I have limited knowledge on biologicals. Um, I think it, they have been shown to do that successfully in contexts well enough to say, let's, you know, create this product and sell it and continue working on it while we sell it. But um, given the extreme range of soil conditions and textures and pH out there, you can't expect them to have tested in all those conditions. So, right, so those organisms may or not, may or may not survive, reproduce, compete, and perform whatever function you're asking them to um, in all those contexts. Great, yeah. So um, you showed some some papers and and uh, information about things like NPK amendments, manure amendments um, that really don't change the the grand community structure, even with repeated additions. Um, and also pointed out that biological amendments are adding a tiny, tiny proportion to an already existing thriving community. Um, so, so what are the factors that, that actually might change community structure and, um, should that be what we're focusing on? Yeah, well, I will say, first of all, that I think the tools that we have to measure microbial community structure are pretty limited. Um, that might sound surprising, but I've been working with DNA sequencing data for most of, um, my research career, and those can't tell you absolute values of microbes. They can only tell you relative to each other what's changing, right? So species A might look like it's going up, but it could be because species B went down. So part of it is maybe we could get better understanding of community changes with new technologies. I don't think that's going to completely transform, you know, what we know. Um, and what we do, when we do see strong changes in community structure, it's often with these long-term trials. That's part of the value where you have different cropping systems in place for many years in a row in the same soil type, same place, same texture, you know, everything else controlled. Um, but then when we do these big soil surveys, even just if it's a few counties, it's really hard to tease apart, tease out microbial community you know, what is affecting microbial communities when we know that texture and pH are gonna affect those community compositions more than management in most situations. Right, yeah, so it, very important to keep in mind that the environment, the, the grand environment <clears throat> is, uh, presents uh, very heavy pressures on determining that microbial community. Um, many things that we we can't change, mm -hmm. right? Um, so wonderful. And um, can you speak to um, pH a little bit around this? So so soil pH is um, is uh, affects many many things in in soils. And of course, we have a a, a pH of native soils. And pH um, is changed over time by fertilization. Um, is is pH something that um, does affect the microbial community overall, and um, and in particular the the establishment of introduced microorganisms? Hmm. I I can't think of any research about the establishment of reintroduced or introduced organisms, but I wouldn't be surprised if that exists. Um, but yes, pH has been found to be, um, I guess if you think of a pH gradient, that is one of the things where you'd see turnover in species composition along that gradient. Um, however, there is a lot of functional redundancy in, in these microbial communities, partly from things I described of horizontal gene transfer and among other things. So you might not see huge shifts in function, um, even if you do see a shift in pH and community composition. And again, the community composition shifts that we're seeing are, are not maybe as big as some people would expect. You know, they're not all members of this community, a 
are completely different from community B at two pH levels difference. It's more, you know, in that 10% range or less, I would say most of the time. You use the phrase functional redundancy and kind of explain that. Can you mm. target that, that phrase for us? Yeah, functional redundancy is, is just this idea that there are a lot of different types of organisms doing the same processes that have the same metabolisms um, in the soil. So there's a lot of different organisms decomposing lignin and complex materials, and then different ones that are mineralizing the nitrogen into inorganic forms, right? So there's just such a diversity of microbes out there that we, we see that while we can't pinpoint which groups are always doing what, those functions seem to persist in the soil even when the comp composition shifts a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems that um, there are there are a couple of different types of microbial amendments. There are um, what is traditionally known as sort of bugs, bugs in a jug. Uh, so blends that are meant to increase overall microbial activity and uh, decomposition functions. And then there are some that are, uh, that are uh, uh, function oriented like rhizobial inoculants and uh, even uh, mycorrhizal fungal inoculants. Um, can you speak to maybe the overall mm, effectiveness uh, of those types of amendments? I, I really can't <laughs> compare them. Um, I, will, I will say that the bugs in the jug, sometimes they are providing dormant microbes, right? So they can be transported and exist and not die. Um, and they might be activated in the right conditions. So if you can have um, the right soil conditions for those particular microbes, they will probably proliferate and, and do well. Um, as far as byproducts from microbes or these other types of products, again, you have to have the right conditions in the soil so that they aren't just eaten up by other microbes or something like that, you know, that, that are really, if you can apply it right to the, where you want on your plant, then there's more likely that product's going to work. Um, so, you know, in that sense, those types of products, I think do need to be focused on adding right to the roots or, or close to the base of the plant. But that's, you know, that's really the extent of my knowledge I should have brushed up on. <laughs> well, so so that's an important point, I think. So if you're using an amendment that is an organism that lives on the rhizoplane or even in the root, then putting that inoculant next to the seed or in the root zone uh, is likely to be more meaningful than adding it to bulk soil. Right. So placement right. and acknowledging the importance of the environment for that uh, inoculated organism. Yes. Um, kind of a specific question. Um, is it known or, or how, how can it be determined in, in research how many microorganisms are needed for a given function? That is a super interesting question. And, and I think about these types of questions a lot. I've really wanted to measure functional redundancy and measure um, measure these kinds of things. And I don't, I, I haven't worked with most of the omics tools. Um, there could be something there with understanding the amount of exudates that are produced uh, and the metabolites that are produced by microbes by keying in that on those things more in a controlled setting. But my fear is that a lot of times when we do these experiments in the lab and then try to bring them out to the field, we see really different behaviors of those microbes in the field setting. So I honestly don't have a great lead. If I would, that I would stay in this field and I would be doing that right away uh, on how to measure that question. That's a really good and important thing to be considering. Great. Thank you. 
Um, so a, a reminder to our audience, uh, we do we would like you to answer just a one question survey um, after each of the talks. And you can reach that question by clicking on the Engage tab above the uh, video stream. And then to get back to the video, just click on the video tab. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Potter, um, for that information.